Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we explore the future and what this means for your leadership. We ask the big questions. What's happening on the horizon? What does this mean for us? And most importantly, what skills do I need now for leadership of the future? It's time to explore. Let's go. Hey, it's Zoe, and welcome back to the show. What's happening on Planet Human? Well, I'm recording this before we went on summer break. So in Planet Human right now, there's still two wars going on, at least. There's the war in Ukraine, and there's the war in Israel and Gaza, and they both suck. And in other good news, though, there's (laughs) Sam Altman is back at OpenAI, and ChatGPT moves forward. So uplifting news, perhaps. On Planet Zoe, as I mentioned, I am on lead. Anyway, I should be by the time you get this episode skiing in Japan, hopefully having a fantastic time. As I record this, my other news is that Olympus Bound, the sequel to the Olympus Project, is back with the editor to do line edits. So we are getting into production mode. I've ordered the book cover. And so we're getting into excitement mode. And I've started mapping out the book launch process for 2024. Woohoo! By the time you listen to this, I should have a firmer plan of when the book will be available. So it all depends on the two other editors and the toing and froing that goes on as we get the thing ready for production. Well, speaking of production, that leads in a not so subtle segue, in fact, a very ineffective segue into asking the question, how do you lead productivity? Mm -hmm. See, like no segue connection whatsoever. How do you lead productivity? My guest today is amazing. He's been on the show twice before. His name is Dermot Crowley. He is a productivity expert, one of the best, if not the best in Australia. He's written four books on productivity and his latest one called Lead Smart, How to Build and Lead Highly Productive Teams is out right now. It's great. You can read my book reviews on Goodreads or Amazon. I love it. I love talking with Dermot. He always has some very subtle insights into what is productivity, some great takeaways that you can implement straight away for your own personal productivity, as well as working with other humans, which is always a complex thing. So without further ado, here's Dermot. Welcome back to the show for the third time because he's amazing, Dermot Crowley. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Wow, third time. I should write more books and then I can just keep coming on here. (laughs) Well, that's right. You keep producing awesome books that are so helpful to people, which is obviously why you're here. And just to answer the first question, which I forgot to ask, where are you actually in the world right now? So I'm just, I'm, I'm normally based in Sydney, but uh, we've got a place up at uh, McMaster's Beach, which is about an hour and a half from, from Sydney, uh, up north um, near Gosford. And um, I'm very lucky, uh, I guess because of COVID, it kind of really shifted everything and, and the realization that I could actually run my business um, as well from somewhere like this as, as from my office in Sydney. So um, I kind of split my time between Sydney and, and uh, the beach lifestyle now, which is very, very nice. <laughs> That's going to be me next year. So I'm pretty excited. And yes, <laughs> live on to living our best lives in the way that we see fit. And probably you're more productive there as well, I'm guessing. Well, certainly when it comes to writing and things like that, I, I am. I, I'm, well, I guess one of the things that I'm quite good at is is having, you know, a couple of hours of super productive work and, and then being able to, you know, go for a swim or make lunch or whatever. But So I don't feel that I need to be productive all day long every day. But if I can have a couple of hours of really, really super productive time, um, that's good for me. And this is the sort of environment that helps me to do that. Love it. So Dermot, we've got Lead Smart, How to Build and Lead a Highly Productive Teams, your book number four. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But although book number three in the Smart Trilogy, but book number four overall, that's right. That's right. Because then you had the breakout book, Urgent, which is talking philosophically about how Indeed. urgent is scuppering all of our worlds. And then back into the Lead Smart or the Smart uh, Trilogy. Absolutely. So why this particular book? I would like to to say that it's been a, a plan from the very start. Um, it hasn't. Uh, it it, it kind of evolved uh, as I went. 
Um, but the, the, the short story is when I wrote my first book, Smart Work, my whole world was personal productivity. And when I thought about productivity, that's all I thought about. How do I help people to be more personally productive? And, and I wrote the book, Smart Work. But when I wrote that, my realization then was productivity was so much more than just personal productivity. It's certainly an important part of it, but I kind of was able to stand on that piece of work and then see another horizon, which was what well, ended up in smart teams. And that was much more about productivity cultures and the realization that, you know, I could train everyone in an organization to be personally more productive, but that's only going to be a short term gain if they're going back into a culture that just kills their productivity all over again. So I, I really thought about productivity cultures, things like your meeting culture or your email culture. And urgency was a part of that. It was a kind of little small bit piece in, in smart teams. But then my realization was when I wrote smart teams, I, I realized that urgency needed its own book because it was such a big issue and such a big topic that it actually deserved to be a book on its own. So I wrote that. And then finally, my realization was, you know, talking about personal productivity in organizations and talking about um, productivity cultures, none of that is ever going to really get traction unless productivity has been led by the leaders in the organization. And I guess one of the things I've always found is leaders need this more than anyone. And yet they're the ones who are most likely to ne never do anything about it because they are so busy and they're so senior that they kind of feel that they're almost beyond productivity training. So I really felt that I needed to write a book that would talk to the productivity issues at the leadership level because there are some distinct issues that leaders face when it comes to their productivity. But it also needed to talk to how do I help leaders to actually lead productivity in their organizations and hence the you know you've got smart work you've got smart teams we call this lead smart because I, I really like the play on on the words that you need to you know do your leadership a bit smarter maybe but it's also how do you lead the smart productivity philosophy within your team and I think that focus on intrapersonal so what's happening in your own personal world then how you engage with others around you and then how do you lead the whole concept of productivity is is a nice stepping stone for leaders to, to embrace because in the conversations I have with leaders it's people are drowning in task they have way too much task for the time that they have so anything you can do to do it smarter is better and one of the things I find also is that leaders flounder in helping their team members be productive, whether it's just showing them or working with them to develop productivity strategies, which you came up with in uh, Smart Work, or working with the systems that, that uh, of operation and interaction between people, which we'll get to in just a second. One of the great things that I really liked about this particular book is you talked about productivity types, and it was a uh, discovery you made along the way about, oh, there's actually different types of productivity and people have different styles. Can you tell us a little bit more about those types? And then the second part of uh, that question is how can leaders help use that to build a productive culture? Sure. So yeah, this was very much a, a personal learning um, that I had where I, I, you know, one of the things that I noticed um, when we were running personal productivity training was that I've built a productivity system that I really believe is perfect um, for anyone like me who wants to be more productive. But then my realization was, well, not everyone is like me. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it's crazy, but it's true. <laughs> I, I love being organized. I love a schedule. I love a task list. I love clearing my inbox to zero on a regular basis. And if you put me in a pressure situation, what I tend to do is I'll immediately go, okay, I'm, I'm stressed. Let's get organized. Let's get, get clear the decks. Let's get focused. And that was my natural bias. And um, I kind of thought everyone was like me. Or if they weren't, they wanted to be like me. Or they should be like you. <laughs> exactly. And that, that's maybe the dark side of it, isn't it? 
But not everyone should be like me necessarily. And, and there are other productivity styles that are equally valuable. So I was, I was working with a friend, um, a, a friend in common, Lisa O'Neill, who is, she would admit, quite disorganized in many ways, although she gets a huge amount of stuff done. And my realization working with her was that she brought a lot of energy to the table. So whereas I would say I had a bias for being organized and I would call myself an organizer, she had a bias for energy and I kind of called her an energizer. So she would leave things until the last minute and then she would just bring a whole ton of energy to the, the um, deadline and she'd get it across the line. Now there'd be a flurry of activity and everyone around her would be left you know, panting breathless, but she'd get it done. So uh, it was just a different way of operating um, to the way I had. And it was interesting because I had to collaborate with her on a couple of things. And it was challenging because, uh, you know, I wanted I wanted the plan in place five weeks before the deadline, whereas she started thinking about it five minutes before the deadline. And that was very frustrating for me. But I was probably equally as frustrating for her because I'm sending her emails going, hey, what's going on with this? Well, you know, when are we going to start working on this? And she was going, ah, we've got plenty of time. There's, you know, still three weeks to go. There's still two weeks to go. Still one week to go. We've got plenty of time. So that was that was interesting. And, and then I think that there's probably a third bias, if you like, or, or archetype, um, which is what I would call an analyzer. And, and they're people who are really good at deep focus. So they, they tend to use uh, the power of attention to get things done. And I, I kind of imagine that, that often these people would naturally gravitate to roles like being lawyers or analysts people who do deep thinking as a part of their jobs and they actually use that deep thinking as a way of getting stuff done which is kind of different to me as an organizer and, and definitely different to Lisa as a, an energizer so yeah I just um, uh, you know I guess I'm still exploring the potential of that line of thinking and I'm exploring each of these three archetypes but I think it's just at the most basic level, it's useful to understand that other people are different to you. They have different ways of organizing themselves. And if we can learn to work in with that, it's going to remove some of the productivity friction we might experience. I don't know how you resolve the conflict that you just highlighted that leads to frustration between the organizer and the energizer because they've got two competing value sets. And it makes me think about it's kind of a power struggle in some ways, like whose system or approach will win because working alongside one another, the organizer needs things ahead of time. The energizer does it the last minute. That seems unresolvable. So how do you actually end up resolving that power struggle? Look, I think it's often about, first of all, recognizing it and talking about it, making it explicit. I think it's also useful to maybe bring to the table one of the concepts that I talk about in the book, um, which is the idea of working in an others-centered way. So a piece of research done in the, in the UK in, in 2021, and they talked about people who had a bias for being self-centered versus people who had a bias for being others-centered. And they found that teams where people there was more people in the team who were other-centered than self-centered. They tended to be uh, a lot more productive and they tended to collaborate better. And, and essentially, other-centeredness is the, the mindset that if we can't have an equal win-win between us, if we have to work together and it can't be 50-50, you're pleased, I'm pleased, then if I'm other-centered, I'm more likely to give you the benefit rather than take the benefit from myself. Um, and it, the, there's a piece of research that they did around this where you know, they put people in pairs and they gave one of the pairs five coins and they asked them to divide them as evenly as they possibly could between the two people. And that meant that they either needed to keep three coins for themselves and give two coins to the other uh, person or the other way around, they give three coins to the other person or keep two coins for themselves. And they found that the people who tended to give three coins to the other person, they were the ones who were more uh, likely to be others-centered. And the, when they went on to 
think about that more deeply and the implications of that, the realization was that there was a value in me helping you by figuratively giving you the three coins because I know that down the track you will in turn help me so that there's a, a value in, in promoting um, your, your uh, benefit, if you like. I guess when it comes to this idea of um, you know having an organizer and an energizer, I think we might be comfortable in our own style and we might want to work in that way. But if we open up to the fact that that is maybe going to negatively impact the other people around us that we're working with, we might approach it with a more other-centered um, mindset and therefore change or modify our style in certain situations to benefit them. And uh, look, that's kind of deep work that teams need to do. But I think just to start talking about it uh, is a useful thing. I think it's a nice framework for to help people unpack why some people drive you bonkers and what you can do about it. <laughs> and as you're talking about that research, about the, the coin-based research study, it reminds me of two things. The law of reciprocity, which was documented in Influence by Cialdini, which talks about when you give somebody something, there's kind of an expectation that something will come back in turn, which is what you implied in like, you know, it's good karma, essentially. And it also reminds me a little bit of Adam Grant's research that he showcased in, what's it called? Givers and Takers? In any case, his research, so that those who give, who are givers, like say of their coins, of their time, of their resources, are more successful in the workplace with one caveat, as long as they didn't give, give, give endlessly to martyrdom and that there were some sensible boundaries in there as well. So to give with... And be able to ask later is the is the thing, but not not a give and take in equal measure. It's like I give without expectation, and I also have the power to ask. And so I think that nice balance of being like, okay, I will flex on this one for you, and in a different situation, you might say, I need some flex back on on this particular one. That sounds like a healthier way of approaching it, and rather than being having to be the one always changing your modus operandi because i would think that would be really difficult if you're an organizer if you always have to cowtail to the energizer say for example that's just going to be endlessly frustrating as opposed to a specific thing where in this particular project you can adapt to it so mike i do have a question in this long <laughs> in this long soliloquy <laughs> um and it's around boundaries actually so and it's Again, around boundaries and power, sort of moving a little bit through this conversation with this idea is, I'll use my example. So I set some boundaries for myself. I don't want to take meetings on Mondays and Fridays. And yet, when sometimes when I get requests, my boundaries get swamped or stomped on. I allow them to get stomped on. So all of a sudden, I find my calendar full of meetings on Mondays and Fridays, and I start to resent, well, basically myself. <laughs> We're letting this happen. And I'm wondering if it's, what is it about that? Why do people break their own productivity rules? Is it a power thing? What do you see as that source of that? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think when it comes to the productivity of leaders, this is one of the most central issues that I, I would talk about. Most leaders that I work with have a very, very compressed schedule and they have the balance between time in meetings versus time protected for other priorities is way out of whack. And so, you know, it's not unusual for me to work with leadership teams where they would say that they would spend 90% of their core working hours in meetings. And they try to protect time as much as they can, a bit like you, but that time just always seems to get eaten up and they, they kind of, they almost become victims of their schedule. And I, I've thought a lot about, you know, what, what actually happens here. I think a part of it is that we are naturally more selfless than we are selfish. So kind of, if you, if you flip this slightly on, on the, um, the other sentence um, theme, Rather than be selfish and, and completely protect our own time and then tell everyone else to go away, we tend to 
uh, be selfless a little bit. And, and when someone will come along and say, look, I just need half an hour with you. Can you fit me in? And we, we want to help other people. So we, we fit them in. But there's always a, an opportunity cost. What What is compromised is the time that we had in our minds protected for some other priority. A part of it is about the insistence of other people. So, you know, if you think about when, when in, in the old school world where you'd actually have a telephone on your desk, when the phone rings, it might not be the most important thing that you need to do, but it's going bring, 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 and it's insistent. So we have this compulsion to pick it up and answer it. I think that other people are insistent, sometimes overtly, Sometimes we actually allow them to be insistent. And by that, I mean we, we make their needs urgent, even though they might not actually be urgent. But because it's from a colleague or a peer or our boss or a client, we allow that interruption or that piece of work to come in and, and go over the top of something else that we were planning to do. The thing that we were often planning to do is often something that is more flexible in nature. So I, you know, from a personal productivity point of view, I talk about the idea of having two types of activity that we need to manage. There's fixed activities, which tend to be your meetings, which are fixed in time. They have to happen at a specific time. And then there's more flexible activities like priorities and tasks and emails and, and all the other stuff that we need to do. And the difference between those two types of work is your meeting workload is a, a type of activity that has to happen at a certain time. So we agreed to meet at three o'clock and it needs to happen at that time. There's no point trying to knock that off the list at nine o'clock in the morning because no one else is going to be there. So it has to happen at a, a particular time, whereas a priority or a task is something that needs to happen by a certain time. So usually it doesn't matter when we do it, it's totally up to ourselves, it's flexible and discretionary in nature, but it needs to be done by Friday or it needs to be done by the 24th of November or some deadline that um, we need to meet. And the thing is that if, if that piece of work is not close to its deadline, we are very likely to dismiss it as a priority and make something more insistent, more important, or somebody more insistent, more important than that priority. And then what will happen is that priority will sit in a list until it becomes urgent. And it's only then that it becomes insistent. So there's something in that um, that we, we, we mean to do things but we put them off because we can and someone else is at our door knocking on it saying, can I see you? Um, I just need you for half an hour this week. So uh, there's a whole lot of complex issues there uh, and it, it, it really starts off with people having a good um, organising system for the things they need to do. But a little trick that I often give leaders when it comes to actually protecting time and then honouring because there's the problem. So you've already said Monday and Friday I'm kind of protecting for other work that I need to do. I'm not going to give it away to meetings, but something assistant comes along and you give it away to meetings. So protection is one thing, but honouring that protection is a whole different kettle of fish. So what I say to leaders is give your bigger picture, and by that I mean your, your goals and objectives, the different roles that you might have in your world and your projects, they all tend to be bigger picture items. Give them an avatar and actually allow them to be a stakeholder in your world. So just like the chairman of the board or the chairperson or the CEO or one of your peers or a key client, they all have an avatar will give your goals and objectives an avatar and, and say to yourself, recognize in yourself that if you dismiss them to deal with this seemingly urgent meeting, then you are actually not serving your goals and objectives or the project that you were gonna work on or the book that you were gonna write. 
by giving it an avatar, it's a little bit harder to dismiss it without some level of guilt, maybe. Does that make sense? I love it. That's a great idea. So I'm thinking, okay, what gets pushed out of my schedule? And the unhelpful frame I was using is because, oh, because they have all the power and I'm just cow tailoring to their power. Not a helpful narrative. <laughs> Much more empowering. It's like, okay, what was I going to do in that time slot? And if it's meet with Sylvester, i.e., perhaps the avatar for my next book. Yeah, yeah. I'd be less likely to write off Sylvester for the sake of whatever the other meeting is. It's like, oh, what am, what am I going to tell Sylvester now? I love it. So that's about personalizing. And it sort of hooks into this selfless versus selfish paradigm that you're talking about. We already have that innate in us. We want to be of service. We want to uh, be selfless in our interactions with others rather than trying to do something that's anti our own nature, which is being selfish and putting those strong boundaries. That's great. Thank you, Dermot. That's a really great, mm. a really great insight. And going back to your previous uh, comment, I think that it needs to be done in balance. So there are going to be some times where we need to compromise and we need to say, okay, this is urgent and, and this is a better use of my time. And sometimes you need to be firm and go, no, I'm going to need to um, say no to this one because I had made, it, made a commitment to Sylvester and this is important. And, and this is where, you know, we get into prioritization and the fact that so many people, whether they realize it or not, their main prioritization framework is urgency. Because the question they ask themselves about any piece of work is, how urgent is this? And that is a flawed way of prioritizing, in, in, in my uh, opinion. I think that we need to have a, a more nuanced way of prioritizing our work. Well, let's dig into that right now, shall we? So I did some work recently with an organization who was struggling with the whole prioritization issue. So they'd gone through a whole strategic planning exercise, and then they had a list of what they call business as usual that they're trying not to call business as usual, basically a list of stuff they had to deliver on. And how did they then prioritize incoming extra demands that were extraneous to their strategy and extraneous to their deliver like their mainstay deliverables? How do they sift through all that to choose what gets done first and when? So we went through an exercise of developing a prioritization framework around that, which wasn't just well, the two main ways they were doing it is who's asking and when is it due, which is, you know, the urgency issue along with the power dynamic. So how would you recommend that people go about developing a prioritization framework? So first of all, recognizing that um, urgency is often the, uh, uh, the framework that we, we inherently use. And, you know, I often uh, ask um, people and, and often these are leaders you know, how do you prioritize? What is your framework? And, and most of the time, they can't actually verbalize that. They kind of go, actually, I'm not really sure. It's, it's quite intuitive. And, you know, obviously, there's a lot of experience that feeds into the intuitive decisions they might make. But when they really think about it, often it is urgency driven. So there's, there's an equation that I, I will often use, which is, Urgency multiplied by importance equals priority. And most people look at that and they go, yeah, that makes sense. Every priority is going to have some level of urgency or time sensitivity to it. And every priority is going to have some level of importance or value attached to it. So that is a, a, a true statement. But I believe that it's the wrong way around. So I think a far healthier statement is importance multiplied by urgency equals priority. And some people would look at that and go, same, same, you, you end up at the same result. But it is subtly different, but very powerfully different. And, and the idea is that both urgency and importance are lenses that we can look at our work through and I believe the mistake a lot of us make is we either only look at things through the urgency lens. So we always drop that down and say, how urgent is this? Or slightly better, we look at things through the urgency lens first, and then we might consider importance. But what I try and do with leadership teams is to try and flip that and say, 
always try and look at things through the importance lens first and then through the urgency lens. You need to consider both, but it's far healthier if you build a culture where people are not only used to, but actually allowed to look at things through the importance lens and make a decision, is this a good use of my time, first of all? And if it is, then make a decision about, okay, well, do I need to do it immediately or could that wait until tomorrow or is that something I'm going to think about after Christmas? And that takes coaching. It takes a culture that is an importance-driven culture rather than an an urgency-driven culture. And my experience is most organizations I go into, they're all urgency-driven cultures and, and they're drowning in this reactivity and they don't know what to do about it. There's actually quite a lot of nuance around defining what is important as well. And I think that needs teasing out with the leadership teams as well, because it's important to me and to my department, but it's not important to you and your department. And that's where you can get some conflict there, which is the kind of the work I was doing with this particular team is getting them to put on the table what went into making something important. And it included the urgency factor and stakeholders and impact on others. So a bit of other focus and also related to strategy. Like there was, they came up with 15 criteria that were helped contextualize why this thing was important. And then they developed a weighted criteria against each of those to determine like not all aspects of importance are treated equally. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it gave them a bit of an, mm, an mm. Idea, like a number of different ways of looking at the rating of the importance piece as opposed to a very simple, narrow framework. I like that. So being an importance-focused culture as opposed to an urgency-based one is being smart, isn't it? It comes back to that, being smart about what oh, you're doing. I would hope so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nailing it. And, and look, I, I think it also... I think it's about being balanced as well. Um, Like all of this stuff is great in theory, but if it's going to be useful, it has to hold up in the real world. So, you know, I can tell people to, you know, stand by your priorities and, and if it's important, you know, don't let other things derail it and all of these things. But the reality is it is complex. And what is urgent to you might not be urgent to someone else. What is important to someone else might not be important to you. So there's lots of complexity there. But um, when you've got some common language around this, especially as a leadership team, when you're talking about priority, when you understand what that means and and having criteria like that is is brilliant. Um, But it, it just needs to be done in a balanced way. So... I don't want to um, suggest that people have to spend their whole week pushing important priorities forward. Um, They also need to be responsive to the needs of the business or the demands of the everyday. So it's about balance. I feel that I've had a, a very productive week. If I can say, look, I've been quite responsive to all of the things that have come up this week. I haven't been reactive to it. I've been responsive to it. But I've also prioritized some important things and I've moved them forward. And as long as I'm kind of moving all that forward in a balanced way, I'm doing the best I possibly can in challenging circumstances. And that's what we should be doing rather than standing standing by our priorities and not letting anything else get in the way. Yeah, I've heard that a couple of times now from you, a bit of balance, a bit of flex, not be so prescriptive, which I think is is a healthy, softer way of looking at this more more guidelines than rules per se she said trying to channel um <laughs> pirates of caribbean one of the dynamics that your relationships that you talk about maybe it's a dynamic it's a system certainly for leaders is how to work more effectively with their executive assistant their ea and i've seen some fantastic ea and executive relationships and some that uh, just grind a little bit and one of my clients has a very complex set of priorities, different responsibilities, different businesses even. And she is trying to use a very complex online prioritization scheduling system. And she wants her EA to pick it up and run with the system and is feeling overwhelmed by that. And I suggested maybe if you teach your EA some principles about how to filter requests and tasks as opposed to a system. And 
I got some pushback around that. I'm curious about what your approach is to helping executives work with their executive assistants. Is it a systems-based approach? Is it a priority-based approach? I mean, a systems-based or a principles-based or a balance? <laughs> How do you do it? Mm-hmm. Look, I, I think that when an executive takes on uh, an executive assistant or, or a, an EA or a PA or whatever they, they might um, be called, there should be an assumption that the EA is pretty organized because that's their role. And I don't often see executives push their system onto the EA. I often see EAs trying to push their system onto the executive, usually not with any success, but not necessarily the other way around. And I guess I'd be very careful about forcing your system onto somebody else unless you're absolutely sure that your system is best practice and not just your practice. Because, again, you could be an organizer, you could be an energizer, you could be an analyzer. Either way, if you're a senior executive, you probably think that your way is is the best way. But it's just your way. And it's probably been a system that has been either cobbled together over the years and it kind of works and it kind of doesn't work. Or it sounds like maybe with your client, they've thought a lot about what works for them, but their complex mind might like things a very specific way. It's not going to necessarily work for the EA. I actually don't think it matters so much that the EA is using um, exactly the same system as the executive to organize themselves, as long as, as you say, certain principles are in place and are agreed upon and are explicit between the, the pair, if you like. I also think that what is really important when it comes to an EA uh, managing and organizing an executive is visibility. So I'm usually working with uh, executives if they have an EA, and and let's face it, these days they are becoming fewer and fewer. Um, A lot of organizations only would have that position for the very top executives. But if they have an EA, often the EA has access to their calendar, of course, because they organize their schedule, and they usually have full control and access over the calendar. So that's highly visible to the EA. They would also probably have access to their inbox, but there isn't as much visibility there because often the EA doesn't actually understand what is happening in their inbox because if an executive is not managing their email well, They could have thousands of emails in their inbox. Some of them have been read. Some of them haven't been read. A lot of them have been flagged or highlighted in some way. And it's not clear to the EA exactly what's happening here. And and therefore, they can't help them as much as they, they would like to because it's a bit of a dog's breakfast. The third element is the executive's priorities. And that's often completely invisible to the EA. So, um... You know, whatever system the executive is using to try and manage their priorities, it's often fragmented. It's in lots of different places. So they're using their inbox as a bit of a prioritization system. They're writing out a to-do list. They're putting some things in their calendar. They've got actions in their media notebook. It's all over the place. So again, the the, um, EA cannot help very much in that situation. And I believe that if an executive can really think about how do I... How do I bring them into my world so that they've got full visibility over what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to spend my time on? How can I help them to help me? If they can answer that question, then there's going to be a much more successful productivity relationship, I reckon. That's really good. So I've noted access to inbox and understanding it, (laughs) cleaning it up probably, access to calendar and understanding priorities, which comes back to a little bit to principles that we talked about before. And sometimes the executive doesn't have their a finger across two of those, either their inbox or their prioritizing. So it comes back to that personal productivity issue that you mentioned in the first place. If you're going to lead productive teams, you need to be personally productive and got to nail down those first things first. So thank you. That did answer my question about should it be principles or a system? It's neither really. It's principles and calendar and inbox and understanding how we can be more productive together with that. That's awesome. 
All right. Yeah. And, and so just off the back of that, I think one of the things that can bring the executive and the executive assistant together in a meaningful way is to have a really good um, joint weekly planning routine that they do together. So when I when I work with executives, we, we cover something that I call a weekly roar, um, which is what I call a three-dimensional planning process where you look back, you look forward, and then you look up. Um, ROAR is an acronym that stands for, you know, look back and review the week that's just gone and look forward and organize the coming week and then look even further forward several weeks in advance and start to anticipate what's coming down the track and then look up at the big picture and realign and, and make sure that what you're spending your time on over the next few weeks are the right priorities to achieve the big picture stuff. If the executive and the executive assistant actually do that together, it gets them on the same page and a lot of these issues disappear. Love it. And you've been working with Roar as a, as a concept for years, and I think it's fabulous. Thank you for that. Now, Dermot, are you ready for the Fast Five? I think I am. <laughs> Too bad if you weren't. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number one. What's the future tech you most want now? It's already here, but it needs to be better. I reckon better AI to process incoming communications and make sense of all of the noise that we are getting in our inboxes and through our communication tools. Thank you. That's a good one. Number two, what's the best tip you ever got for leadership or productivity? I'll talk to leadership. Um, it's something that I talk about in, in my new book, Lead Smart. It's the above the line idea that I, I first read about uh, in a book called uh, um, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. And that to me just really stood out as a really simple framework to think about, am I above the line as a leader or am I being dragged down below the line as a leader? I love that. And it is it the acronym, the BED or acronym, or is it a different paradigm? Like BED being blame, excuses, denial, which is below the line, and ownership, accountability, responsibility being above the line. Is that similar principle? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, look, that's certainly what um, I think, you know, what I read and, and, and where that the idea comes from. I've kind of taken that above the line idea and just given it a, a productivity spin, uh, which is much simpler. It's just, you know, am I, am I working above the line, i.e. on the things that have impact, or am I being dragged down below the line to do the things that make me busy, busy work, but they don't have as much impact. So I just use it in a simple way, but it's, it's just as powerful. Okay. Number three. What's one problem at work you wish you could wave a magic wand and have it be all fixed right now? I reckon in my client organizations, it's meeting cultures. I just reckon that we need to decompress people's schedules and allow people to protect much more of their time to do important work, to think, to mentor, to actually lead. I, you know, I, I worry that... So many leaders I work with are too busy to actually lead. And, and that's very much down to meeting cultures and organizations. Yeah, nice. Okay, number four, thumbs up or thumbs down. Who's a leader doing something right? And who might be somebody who's doing something a bit terrible, average, <laughs> below the line? I haven't thought too much about the, uh, the, the latter, but the, I'm going to call out. Now, this might seem a little contentious, but I'm going to call out our Prime Minister, Albo. Now, I'm not calling it out for any um, political reason, but I actually used to coach my son's cricket team, and this is going back 10 years ago. And my son went to school with Albo's son, and Albo used to actually coach his son's cricket team. And I got to, you know, be on the field with him. And he wasn't prime minister then, of course. But I have to say that I got to see that man operate in a, a kind of kid's environment, in a family environment. And he always impressed me. And now I see him in politics and he's not that different. OK, he's not perfect in any way, but he just seems to be a fair guy who's trying to do a good job and he always makes time for the things that are important. So that's held through to be able to see him, you know, outside of politics and then see him in politics and, and go, OK, there's an alignment there. I think he must be doing something right. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
Nobody's ever talked about Albanese before on the show and that question. So yay. There you go. <laughs> Number five, your favorite leadership book or podcast. Um, I, I would, of course, you know, besides this, I know. I reckon Good to Great, Jim Collins. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I, that was a book I read that, that kind of stuck with me. And I'm always reminded of it because when I walk into bookstores and, and my book is on the shelf, it's usually next. Well, it's, it's quite often jammed between um, Jim Collins, Good to Great, and um, Stephen Covey, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, because we all begin with C. And I'm often in the middle of the two of them. And, and they both be um, books that uh, I, I think had a lasting impression on me. Mm. Um, I don't talk about either one very much in my work, but they both influenced it in some way, I would say. Nice. Thank you very much for those recommendations. The Zoe Rath Leadership Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Amplifiers Academy. It is an online self-paced leadership development program that you can join at any time and progress at your pace. There are very short video lessons, great checklists and resources and recommendations and book summaries all there to help boost your leadership thinking and abilities. We focus on leading strategy, leading culture, leading change, and leading performance. So if you want a go-to resource that can help boost your strategic abilities immediately, check us out, Amplifiers Academy, on the zoerouth.com website. See you there. Dermot, thank you so much for the conversation today. Where can people find out more about you and your work and your fabulous books? Uh, thank you. So, um, look, if you go to our website, which is www.adaptproductivity.com.au, you'll find all about the programs that we run. And if anyone's interested in having a chat about um, my approach to productivity, would love to um, set up a time for that. Otherwise, my books are in the bookshops at the moment. And if, funnily enough, um, you can always find a copy of Smart Work, um, my, my first book, in Officeworks. Officeworks stocks it and, and have in every store around Australia, which absolutely blows my mind. So there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. And congratulations on the success of that book and all of your books. They're all fantastic. I recommend all of them. Dermot, this has been fabulous. Is there anything else that hasn't been asked that you'd like to answer to? <laughs> Does that make sense? I haven't asked you all the questions I possibly could have. Is there one that you'd like me to ask that you'd like to <laughs> answer? Well, why don't I ask it myself and, and answer it myself? Um, let me uh, think about how I'd frame this question. So I guess, you know, if, if you said to me, what, what's the message that you would like to leave for leaders about productivity and to finish on. I really believe that productivity is a, an issue that is often seen as important in, in most organizations. Productivity is usually up there as one of the important things that we need to think about, but it's often important for everyone else to think about it not for the leaders themselves to think about it because the leaders are often the ones who are too busy to do anything about their productivity. And, and almost it's assumed that now that I've made it to the very senior leadership role, I must be organized and I must be doing things right. And while I'm not saying that any of your listeners are in any way broken or terribly disorganized, of course they're not if they're, uh, if they're operating successfully in a leadership role. But I would say that most leaders kind of need to go from being good at productivity to being really elite at productivity. It's kind of that Jim Collins good to great uh, idea. There's a world of difference between, you know, being good at a bit, your productivity being acceptable and your productivity operating at a truly elite level. Um, so I, I really do encourage any leaders out there to just think about, is my way of organizing myself good enough? Is it, is it just acceptable or, or could it be, you know, stretched to a, a more elite level? When I interface with my team, is that elite or am I actually 
a part of the problem where I'm causing productivity friction for those around me. And then when it comes to my wider team or the wider organization, am I actually leading productivity in a way that allows productivity to flourish? Or am I just allowing people to drown in all of the busyness and and all of the activity that makes us reactive and and everything urgent and and makes us all feel like we're um, really in need of a break. As you, you as a leader, could you do something about that? And I believe the answer is you definitely could. Awesome. Thank you, Dermot. That was an excellent last question to finish on. (laughs) Thank you so much for being amazing and for coming on the show for a third time. It's always a delight to speak with you. And I love hearing your insights because it makes such a big difference. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Zoe. It's always so much fun talking with Dermot. I love him. He used to be my mentor at Thought Leaders Business School, one of my early mentors and has been a great friend and a great guide through the last 10 years, actually. So it's been it's been quite an experience. And I love his work. It's so practical and so helpful. The takeaway for me is creating an avatar of your project slash priorities and embodying that or imagining that when you're looking at bumping them <laughs> for somebody else's stuff. So whatever your boundaries you have, what had you gone to put in there? And, you know, for example, if you always bump exercise, you could have the avatar of your future self and see how they change when you continually bump them from the calendar. Mm -hmm. In terms of a tip for you, and it goes along with the productivity piece, it's from my first book, Composure, How Centered Leaders Make the Biggest Impact. And this is in chapter two, Focused, Choosing the Quest. And people often ask me how I write so much, how I get so much work done, because I am an organizer like Dermot, I'm highly productive. And so you can hear my approach through the lens of organizer, if you like. So this is it. I start with basically the reverse engineering concept. And it goes like this. Prepare the plans. We start with the end in mind. We map our life plan in reverse. Start with the lifetime and legacy vision first. This is how we want work and life to contribute to the evolution of humanity and our planet. This is the big why. Review the first chapter on growth to flesh this out. From here, we reverse engineer life in 20-year blocks, assuming a long-lived life of 100. Choose the theme word for each of those 20 years and how you want them to feel. For example, 40 to 60 might be learning or progress. Once we come to our nearest current decade, start adding in detail. This is the how and what being made a bit clearer. Choose a big picture theme word for the current 10-year block. For example, the 40s might be about parenting or nurture. The 50s might be about contribution, and the 60s might be about harvest. From there, we boil it down to a one-year plan, complete with theme word, holidays, and experiences, who we want to spend our time with, what we want to learn, how we want to beautify our home. Then we plan it out in 90-day projects mapped against quarters. These then break down into weekly plans followed by daily plans. The organizer in me just loves this. It just makes so much sense. So the checklist of plans that you need. Lifetime and legacy vision, the big why. 20-year blocks with feeling theme words, current decade theme word, current one-year plan with the theme word, holidays, experiences, people to spend time with and what to learn, how to beautify the home, 90-day projects, weekly plans, daily plans. I'm giggling because I'm in, <laughs> now that I've understood a little bit more of Dermot's archetypes, that is such an organizer way of doing things. And my energizer friends would be like, ah. Oh, so blah, like, why don't just live things to the fullest and take the bull by the horns as it arrives and follow that dream. And then my deep thinkers, <laughs> my analyzers would be, I'm latching onto this one concept and going deep on that. Anyway, whatever works for you. The idea is think intentionally and deliberately about what it is that you want. So coming up next on the show, we have potentially a solo so potentially a guest as I'm recording this before the summer break. I'm not really sure just yet. (laughs) I'm still working on it. But something wonderful will be at play, that's for sure. What I do know is happening on March the 1st in Canberra, actually specifically in Cup of Cumbalong, is our brand new event called the Leadership Conclave. This is an opportunity to do some reflection and some planning or imagining if you're an energizer or some deep thinking if you're a deep thinker 
about how you want your year to play out as a leader. It's a very small, intimate group between 30 and 50 people. So you get a chance to come along, meet some awesome, amazing leaders from different sectors. Spend the day on you, really thinking about you, really connecting with your peers, uh, doing some big picture planning for what it is that you want to take away for the year. So that's Leadership Conclave. The link will be in the show notes. I would love to see you there. I love meeting listeners face to face. That would be fantastic. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast. To find out more about leadership of the future or to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com. 